Now, I didn't know what you were going to cover today, but one thing that I thought would be really useful would be a list of the common, the common genes when you're both in tomatoes and potatoes that are a list simple, of common genes, simple, um, simple recessives that you've got to spot. Recipe. When well, I could do that uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, that would be quite useful to run through those at some point it, today. Uh, the, the, when you cross a determinate to an indeterminate, you basically get a semi-determinate. It's a little more of the indeterminate than determinate because it doesn't end in blossom, but it uh, usually has a reduced total growth and the production is usually a little more concentrated, not quite so dented out. And of course, semi-determinate don't need to be pruned as heavy as an indeterminate. They're usually more rounded out, whereas an indeterminate it gets elongated, keep growing taller and taller and taller. When it comes to uh, leaf type, uh, the potato leaf crops the regular leaves that usually pretty well known. Potato leaf is recessive, and it recombines in a one to four ratio. I mean, yeah, one to four ratio. But uh, two of those, uh, those four or three that are regular leaf will still segregate the next generation. So it's kind of a tough thing to get rid of if you uh, if you're trying to get rid of the recessive, but if you're selected for the recessive, then it's really simple. Um, some people think potato leaves are um, more disease resistant. Uh, if you go to the United States, you'll see many uh, forms on tomatoes and they, many people swear on it that the potato leaf is more resistant to different foliar problems. I, I think the, the jury's still out on that one. Other things to worry about is nematode resistance. Uh, that's normally a gene that is dominant and you rarely see it in any open pollinated heirloom tomato that is sold as an OP because if you have the nematode resistance on both sides, homozygous, it usually means uh, slightly misshapen fruit, not quite as round, a little, little softer texture and that's because of the genetic drag from the wild species which it came from. So in order to get heirloom varieties that are, that are nematode resistant, about the only way to do it is to get uh, an heirloom variety that is true breeding for nematode resistant and cross it back to the original form and get a hybrid for that one isogenic thing to get the nematode resistant. You probably don't need it here in the UK. Other things, uh, the, the dwarf plants are receptive to tall, but you can have a indeterminate dwarf, you can have a semi-determinate dwarf, or you can have a full determinate dwarf, or you can even have the the uh, what I call a bird net type of foliage, very prostrate, very much like a hanging basket or tumbling tom type dwarf. How would you categorize latter? <sighs> Been a long time since I drew that, probably about 30 years since I had that. And uh, I, I would have to ask you a few questions. Is this the one that's slightly in an octart shape of the fruit, or is this a round one? Mostly round and flattened. Mostly round and flat. Okay, that's a different than the cone I had years ago, so I probably won't be able to help you on that one. It's just the shape of the plant is very strange, and the, the leaves are very far apart. They're very widely spaced on the stem. And it doesn't look... It's definitely not a vine, but it's not really a bush. It's just kind of... The leaves are kind of floppy-like. It just sort of flops everywhere. Yeah. And, and but that, it doesn't grow flat. Yeah, okay. Just, it comes up to about this high and then kind of... It allows the sun to penetrate the, the vine yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a lot that, of sunlight. That's access. very important for any place that's far north or a lot yep. of cloudy weather. I know in the, in the United States, in the far north and into southern Canada, in the Quebec, uh, in that area, that the tomatoes had to be a little more sparse leaf in order to allow the sunlight to come through, warm up the soil, warm up tomatoes. Same in uh, Britain. That's why a lot of... Uh, Ox heart types are, are common sometimes in the far north because they have narrow leaves and allow the thunder to come through. Narrow leaf is another one of those more or less recessive type, but you can see it in the hybrid if you cross a, a, a narrow leaf plant to a regular leaf. You can see it in the hybrid. That's why you always try to use the female parent as the receptive because the hybrid will show immediately the, the hybrid effect. You can see it in the ceiling. Um, is, is the narrow leaf you're talking about the same as silvery? Say it a little bit louder. 
Is the narrow leaf that you're talking about the same that you see on silvery fir tree? That tomato? Do you have that uh, tomato? The, 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 the narrow leaf in um, like airy, uh, airy leaf, you'll see it in some of the oak part, you'll see it in the, uh, in the uh, uh, banana leg, the dragged Roman, the uh, Roman holiday. Um, you understand what I'm saying? There's a variety that have a narrow leaf to them. Okay. I could probably think of a number of others right now. I'm trying to just explain it. Uh, the other thing is uh, is the uh, flower type. If you have a lot of flowers on a truss, you know that uh, you can reduce that in a hybrid, but it still it, it shows up. It, it kind of in between. Uh, let's see, cherry types are normally fairly dominant over large fruited types, although it, uh, if you cross a cherry with a large fruited type, your hybrid is closer to a cocktail type, a little bit larger. So, uh, a cherry type that's about an inch and a half, an inch, inch in diameter, maybe an inch and a quarter across to your large fruited type, your hybrid is close to an inch and three quarters in diameter. That gives you some idea of, of the over dominance of the uh, cherry type, but it's not complete dominance. Uh, locule count, normally a low locule count is dominant over many, many locules. So if you cross a cherry tomato with a large tomato with lots of locules in it, your hybrid is going to have very few, usually one more locule than the cherry. So a two locule cherry crop to one that had 20 locules, you'll probably get one that averages out three locules. So low locule count is mostly it, dominant. That's just a, a common thing there. Uh, see, other things. Uh, Clear epidermis, yellow epidermis. Yellow epidermis is dominant. So if you cross a pink to a red, you get a red. And if you cross a, a pink tomato to like a golden jubilee, you'll get a yellow epidermis red tomato. Say that again at half speed. <laughs> <laughs> because I was still uh, I know, the previous one down. Say you cross a tomboy, which is a pink tomato with red flesh, and you cross it to a golden jubilee. The red flesh is dominant over the gold and the golden jubilee, and the yellow epidermis and the golden jubilee is dominant to the pink, clear epidermis of the tomboy. Therefore, your hybrid is a ordinary red tomato with a yellow epidermis. Save the seed, then you'll get some gold with clear epidermis. You'll get gold with yellow epidermis. You'll get some red with clear epidermis, red with yellow epidermis. And those are your combination. So, you're so you've got two genes controlling your fruit color. There's the epidermal color and the flesh color. Yeah. Or have you got more? Yeah. Just yeah. two? Because in sweet corn there's two. They're, 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 those are major ones. There are some others, and, and, and we're getting into an awful lot of detail here for me. But let me just kind of scatter around some other things. Um, um, the fruit shape. If you cross a round tomato with aroma, you'll get a plum normally. But in that plant as you grow it, the first fruit setting will have a slightly different shape than the fruit setting three, four, five, six, seven flower trust later. So oftentimes people complain, well I'm getting different fruit shapes on that hybrid or whatever or that line. You just deal with it. Of course I think that's a kind of a classic cross, a, a long Roma, a long uh, San Marzano type to a round getting that plum type. I think that's a nice combination and I think some variety that are true breeding plums are actually crossover where in, in the meiosis when the chromosome divided that their certain chromosome have both the long San Marzano and the round shape all on the same chromosome so it it has a true breeding like a true breeding uh, hybrid of that to trait. Same as uh, brown flesh that's usually a crossover of the uh, the green flesh and the red flesh. When you have them on the same chromosome, it simply makes them brown or, in some cases, black. But then those are also affected by yellow epidermis clear. And then you have some other things uh, that are in the black. I'm not sure if I can tell you if everything is a crossover, but I think there's some things that are rather interesting that we still need to study on between the black and the, and the muddy colors and the, and the purple black. There's, I got a lot of different varieties, so if somebody wants to help me segregate that that analysis out and figure out what dominant reset is, that would be a great study. So, say you want to know more about genetics, I can send you.
two parent. I continue the hybrid seed of a two. I continue the F2 seed. I continue F3 seed. And selection from that that would be still bouncing around, other that would be stable. So I think it'd be a great study for somebody to get a package of seed of four different eras of that breeding work to study the recombination and, and to be able to take pictures of it all at the same, same year. And I think it'd be a great educational tool to understand genetics because a lot of people don't have the time to do the grow out of the parent, mm -hmm. make the cross, grow the hybrid, put out the F2 seed, and then you follow all that. So that's one of the things I'm hoping that we can, I think the, the Heritage Seed the Library should offer something like that as an educational tool. Yes, yeah, we have students every year. I think so that would be a real interesting thing. To understand uh, segregation of the mm -hmm. uh, genetic. Um, if, if you really wanted a funny thing to work with, I could probably send you two, two straight bread lines that have four or more traits that are different from each other and then uh, they all would react differently in the high, well, the hybrid would all be the same type, but the F2 population would give you many, many different combinations. You'd have to grow 256 plants if you have four traits to be able to see all the segregate. But I think it'd be a great way for students to do a numerical statistical analysis of the probability of, of a certain trait coming down and having the proof for it. I think it'd be a great educational tool. Tomatoes especially are, are easy to grow and, and uh, you can always give away 256 plants, right? <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people love to be given plants, yeah. right? Because they can't grow them themselves. How many people have trouble growing plants? Mm -hmm. Most people do if they can't, if they don't have a good window where they're limited and maybe they only have the allotment, not enough room in the house to grow them. So um, I think it's something that, that people should do more of presenting it as a learning tool. Other segregating or traits, let me think. Uh, can you think of any offhand? Give me a hint of what you want to know about. Um, earliness. Earliness. Interesting how many okay. genes are involved in early earliness. flowering and early fruit. Very time. good. Uh, crossing very, very early with very, very late usually gives you a hybrid that is earlier than what you would expect in a hybrid because anytime you cross two unrelated lines, even if they're late, it, it usually encourages slightly earlier uh, development that hybrid vigor and so if you crop too late you'll get closer to a medium late instead of just too late so crossing early to late will give you pretty close to a medium maturity for the most part kind of halfway between so I would encourage people to try to improve some of the old varieties that are too late for for the UK they need more early not only for outdoors but in the greenhouse you may want to use some common favorites like uh, Gardener Delight and cross with some of those that are very, very late as just an example. Uh, you think that you know about so you can kind of have something to uh, compare with. But as time goes along, you might want to use some of my material that has the prostrate, the hanging basket growth habit with the narrow leaves, allow lots of sun penetration, and allow it to dry out in the, in the damp weather so you don't get the early blight, and allow the fruit to... Uh, hang down like in a hanging basket or a planter box. I'm trying to get more people to grow tomatoes in a planter box and hang basket close to where they live because they maybe don't even have the space for a pot out on their There's a big balcony. push for that type of gardening. Say it again a little louder. There's a big push for that type of gardening. Yes, and I see it all over Europe. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is, and I have some seed with me, uh, da, 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 two or three of them have that growth habit. It, I may have to distribute seed. What we got? One, two, three, four people here today. That's not enough. So probably, Patrick, you'll probably have to distribute this seed to people who request it from here, from from Holland to the UK. No problem. I would suggest that, and I'll get the numbers and what they mean later. But the seed I want to distribute will segregate for for these things. It'll be segregating for color, for fruit types and shape, flavor, the hanging basket type and, and early blight. Some of them will segregate for a very sweet type, other very tangy, other will be segregating for the blues, and then I mentioned the uh, the segregation of the green zebra types into all the different types of uh, red with blue stripe, yellow with blue stripe, green with blue stripe, all of that kind of thing. So, I got quite a diverse amount of stuff to work with. So if you're looking for 
something to study for making improvement do you can offer them or if you're just looking for things to study for the genetics of it there's a lot of opportunity and talking about the green flesh is receptive to red but the funny thing about it when you cross green to red you get red but when you save the seed you don't get just red and green you get some red some kind of muddy red with a a little bit of a greeny gel. You get some red tomato with a kind of a yellowish gel. You'll get a few that look kind of brownish red of the fruit, and the seed will be green. You'll get some that are that are um, that are green, but the gel look funny. And you get some that are yellow that have green gel. And then you get some that are yellow with yellow gel. So you get you get strange things happening, and I can't explain how you can take two genes and you get all these other combinations out of it. And then if you combine that with high lycopene, that really fools you know, when, you, when you segregate it because you're getting a redder gel. A red gel is uh, mostly receptive to regular gel, so if you're trying to get the very, very red gel, which is the high lycopene, it almost has to be homozygous. And there are very, very few heirloom varieties that have this super high lycopene gene. And the neat thing about the lycopene gene is that you can tell it in a flower because the flower, when it's true breeding for that, has the so-called OG flower, old gold. In other words, the anther didn't be in a real bright yellow, it's more of a erotic mm -hmm. antique gold yellow, if you can understand that, old gold. And you can only see it during certain kinds of light. So if your eyes aren't any good and you've got too much light, you're not going to see it. So you almost have to have a certain cloudy day in order to see it. But then again, maybe in the UK you can yeah, see well. it. Yeah, <laughs> well, we can supply those, no trouble. Yeah. So if you don't know what the old goats look like, I can give you some uh, link to that. Uh, you just uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll link you to what an old goat looks like. Uh, the blue is just slightly dominant. It's not totally dominant. It's a, it's a perfect example of halfway between. So to get that light mediated blue in the perfect expression, it has to be homozygous. Let's see, what other traits? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so green shoulder. The blue is recessive? I'm sorry, say it again. The blue is recessive? No, it's, it's in, in, incomplete dominant. And what is that? That's an epidermal gene, is that? that it, it, uh, it, it turns the epidermis, or right underneath the epidermis, some of the pericarp slightly blue as a hybrid. But in the F2, I mean, in the F2, you get the dominant, uh, uh, the, the receptive, as a homozygous, and then you actually have that pericarp quite blue. Okay. But in order to get that blue to really dominate the fruit, in a large fruit, you're not going to get much anthocyanin. The smaller the fruit, the more anthocyanin you're going to get. So my approach is to distribute seed that has the West Virginia 700 in it, that has this half inch size fruit combined with the blue so it can be combined to get the smallest fruit possible and the bluest fruit possible so when you cut that fruit open the only thing that's not going to be blue is the gel and the seed and in order to make a blue sauce or a blue spaghetti sauce or a blue jam or a blue marmalade I should just squeeze the seed out and then prepare that that way. And so blue, what skin color do you have in with that? With and the, the skin blue. color on the blue could be a clear or a yellow epidermis, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, see if I have enough people to participate in this segregation thing to see if we can find this blue to be very well expressed, hopefully with some other gene. In other words, a synergistic action of a gene might encourage that blue to be even more intense. It might be with the... Uh, 8P gene, high pigment gene. That's another thing that's independent and it can make a red tomato redder and make a green tomato greener. So there's other associated genes that if you want to play around with, let me know you want to play around with those and we can uh, get those crosses made and sent to you. I'm trying to encourage people to look at genetic from the standpoint of the um, uh, organically grown heritage type variety as, as a source of uh, an education for a lot of people, a resource for a lot of genes that we can use in further breeding. So rather than being like the 
currently the Heritage uh, Teen Library is, make it a, a storehouse of all kinds of genetic resources that could be more readily available rather than just like the, the uh, Rick uh, Dermplasm Resource in Davis, a little bit more proactive and, and not just available to researchers but available to anybody who wants them and then set up in such a way to be instructional material.